So I come from a research and role-playing games background. So my, I, I quickly just want to run through my perspective on uh, this amorphous beast that is not to be named. Uh, because this landscape is a lot about games, gamification today, different media channels and so on. But for me, the central thing about the landscape that we're all operating in is the fact that our multiple channels in this chaos star of whatever we're doing, a lot of those are communication channels. They are not single uh, directional broadcast methods, but they uh, allow uh, participation and co-creation. And then you have to ask yourself, like, what the heck is participation or uh, interactivity? And I usually use this kind of model uh, to analyze who produces cultural stimuli today and how are they organized. Traditionally, of course, for the last 500 years, you have an author who writes something, it can be a band or a movie maker or whatever, and it pushes it towards an audience who shuts up and listens. Uh, the interactive model uh, is seen as sort of a great revolution and so on, but it's basically the same thing, only that the author now organizes the impressions that you're about to consume into a nifty little tree, and then you go eat it. So basically, you, you decide the order that you consume already pre-packaged and pre-produced cultural stimuli. When you go into participation, all bets are off. Uh, what you would, it, well, the, the closest comparison I can have is sort of a party organizer. Somebody organizes a party, throws in a DJ, and the participants make the party. The party organizer is not the one uh, making sure that people have fun. If people don't have fun with each other and create stimuli for each other, like in a tabletop role-playing game, like in a BDSM club, like in EVE Online, like in, at the football game, people create the impressions for themselves. And I do believe that this is sort of the original form of human creation. This is how we basically started creating art with each other. But that sort of begs the question today, what is the, m what, what is the most typical format for this? I would say, coming from a, a role-playing background, I would choose the Nordic live-action role-playing scene as a very good case example on how massive co co-creation can work uh, and how it can be very liberated from uh, like a singular author. Uh, you, we usually think about it as fantasy games in the forest for teens, but up in the corner there, for instance, are some lovely gentlemen for the game, from the game Just a Little Loving, which is about the gay scene in New York between 1982 and 1984, with the HIV years and so on. So we, we're leaving the traditional genres, and, and now the, 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 the field is wide open for all kinds of stories. So this takes me to sort of the central core of, of my little talk today, and that is, can, what can you get out of user engagement? What can you get at the, the, uh, another buzzword is user-created content, or user-generated content. I think that is sort of looking down the nose at the user, saying that they generate content rather than create. Uh, but okay, let's be sober about this. Is there any user-generated content that is useful for your project or within your project? Uh, a lot of the time, it is crap. Uh, the in the computer games industry, it's nude mods, where you basically strip the characters and can see them naked. Fantastic stuff. Uh, in fan fiction, of course, it's ridiculous, sometimes hateful, sometimes sexually overt power fantasies about your characters, like, yeah, um, Voldemort, uh, Harry Potter rape scenes or whatever. I mean, it's, it's playing with the IPs, but it's not great literature. Um, you can have people imitating the karate moves of Jackie Chan and so on, which makes for uh, lol on, the, on YouTube for about 30 seconds, but not much more. And, uh, and of course, in live action role-playing game, you have people building costumes to enable the illusion. But I sort of get stuck on the idea, like, if, if we have this powerhouse of, of co-creators, of participants are in there, and they are writing shitloads of blog posts, and they are really engaging into our games, how do we leverage that power to get something out of it that is useful in our own project? And I did that by transmedia bumming my way through, uh, through a project called The Artists. I did one game for Swedish television called The Truth About Marika. It was fortunate enough to win an Emmy. That means that other people actually hired me as a transmedia bum. And the, the, uh, the basic idea that I had was like, okay, so I'm deeply into live action role playing. I know how to organize that. Uh, I know that 
the, like the depth of emotion and how like extremely visual and visceral this can be. Uh, and one of the sort of unspoken truths of live action role playing is that it absolutely cannot be recorded. Uh, because A, the, in most settings cameras are not welcome. Uh, B, it's going to break the illusion and people are going to become scared and nervous and so on. But I thought like, okay, so this is like an unspoken truth. Then of course we have to challenge it and, and just fly in the face of it. So within the scope of a <coughs> five uh, state broadcaster television series called The Artists, uh, we set up the scenario so that there was space for a larger community around the main characters. This is written into the story from day one. It is basically about a group of, uh, of contemporary artists who get very, very fed up with the value chain of buyers, uh, artists, gallerists, curators, and the power structures between them. And they um, uh, do something wild and get uh, hunted by the police. And they are supported by their, own, uh, their old uh, uh, commune where they have lived and worked together. So we say, hey, let's make that commune for real. So I just returned one week ago from Denmark where the warehouse lived for 72 hours, filled with 40 live action role players and the main actors from the series. And I'm now looking at <laughs> frigging more than a terabyte of footage from that game. It's hundreds of hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours and everything is filmed from people's iPhone perspectives and so on. So now I'm left the, with the big question, I've done it, but is it going to be worth anything? Uh, and like, I've, I've only glanced a little bit at some of the material, and I realize I'm in the same position as a docu-soap director or docu-soap editor at this point. So we have a lot of footage, some good, some bad. Um, the one, Simon Kölle, who you may know from the Pirate Bay project, was there shooting the whole thing. And he said, it, it's, like, it, it's like someone set me up. Uh, like, there are all these powerful personal stories going on all the time in ten times the pace of normal life. So he gets ten times more dramatic material than he would if he only was shooting people or if it was a docu-soap. So I was really like arguing, should I show anything from it and so on, because I only have my little iPhone things on my hair. But I just found like one minute of stuff so you can see super rough, nothing is edited, and so on, but just get a little impression of what it is to step into this, li this little world. So here we go. We are crazy. I mean, 300,000 for this, 7,800, I mean, are we fucking crazy or what? I mean, I've seen you guys, you know, that, you know, behind this fucking shit, you were like, oh man, I'm not gonna do this, and then you go there and you're like, oh, 50,000, okay, come on, I mean. Have you found something to sell yet? The, uh, the ass. My ass. It's not yours to sell, sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, I think he's pr pretty much handling that himself. <laughs> what You're I'm saying. selling my ass? Or, yeah, or, or, or rather, can we see what's, what's, what's on the ass? Oh, it's nothing painted on the ass, actually. But this, this, this part over here, it's, worth, it's uh, owned partly by uh, CNN, and it's also owned partly by uh, some Canadian museum, I don't remember. You are not being right with, with your act. I mean, you are not, your behavior was... Here. Obviously, that's who I am, because that's who you say I am. So, then, I guess I am a sheep, false, fake person, because in your eyes I am. Okay, okay you win. I want that mirror. It will be everyone's, and it will be very, very irritating. So, yes, a short s snippet of the, the bizarre place I'm mining. But um, what this, I think this goes to show is that there are experiments in, fi in the sort of leveraging the machine of participation. And it may work this time, it may not, but I think it's definitely an experiment that's worthwhile. Because when we get that, in today when you look at business models for, uh, for computer games, a lot of people are going free to play, where a small, small core are financing uh, the entire experience for everybody else. You say that between 1 and 10 percent of the people playing the game are financing it for everybody else. And here I think we find a use for our hardcore of participants who really enter the story and are willing to take it to the max and maybe even find economical or useful value out of what they create. Um, so that is my current experiment. Taking part of something that's a broadcast, putting out a live role playing scenario, creating a stage.
big, and then the lap stretch feeds back into the front. Yeah. So not only kind of do we spread on platforms, but can, like Hancher said, it talks to each other, it gives mm. back. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, of course, the vision of this is sort of have a standalone series of, of uh, uh, episodes about these like by characters, but all these people stayed on for the shoot, so they are all in the background as extras and so on. So they are directly connected to the series, and of course the main characters are there, and they also give away some hints in how to solve the the greater mystery that of course would roll out during that time. <laughs> so yes, it is really a, 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 a like looking at the players and making them feedback. Also, it's taking the the traditional end event of transmedia games, which is usually at the end, and putting it in the front instead. Because then you have a, an early adapter community that already love and have lived in your universe. Instead of having that as the end result, which makes no sense to me at all. Because then it's just a celebration and an end party. Here you can actually utilize and leverage uh, their engagement. So that's um, about all I have to say uh, on that subject for now. Uh, look forward to the artists in the late 2012. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.